Hi, buddy. Welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor, and today we're going to be talking about luck in League of Legends solo queue. So we're going to be looking at the claim, is solo queue ranked luck? Okay, so d is it unlucky? Um, is it just a coin flip? You'll hear many YouTubers out there sometimes say, oh, well, this is just a coin flip. Each game's a coin flip, or, you know, the beginning of the season is a coin flip, and, you know, you'll get league compared to something like a coin flip at a time and i know that and i'm not going to address specific you know people but you've heard it from all kinds of people from like red mercy sometimes to hashina shin to any number of other people that league is just luck so i'm going to be analyzing this claim and i debated this last night on stream with somebody for probably like an hour or something and this guy just could not understand this and there were several people in the chat that we're having a hard time understanding this concept of well is like what is luck and what is a an elo system where there are multiple players involved right so it's five on five in an elo system where people were ranked based on performance okay so we're going to look at how that interacts so what is luck is solo queue luck and then at the uh near the end i'm going to talk about ways that you can reduce this luck or what people are describing as luck to actually express more skill and climb better. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and just walk through this because this is a very popular topic in a lot of culture, and especially kind of early in the season. This is about uh, about a month, maybe three weeks or so into the season. And a lot of people are, you know, in rankings that they aren't really comfortable with, myself included, um, at this point, you know. So it can feel kind of rough early on in the season when there's a lot more variance, which we'll talk about what that is when everybody has been collapsed, right, or condensed with the, uh, the the reset on the ladder every season. So let's go ahead and uh, go through this. Okay, so what is luck in League? So the way that I'm defining luck, it's a threshold of, aggre of aggregate statistical variance. So it's a collection of um, factors that take away the predictive value from a game and remove agency from a player. So what that means is luck is something that players cannot control that determines their rank. Okay? So if you can control it or you can predict it, it's not luck. Okay? Um, and if bad things happen every now and then, that is variance. That's a statistical term that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. But the question is not, can an individual game be decided by factors outside of the control of a player? Um, and that's what... The second point is here. Can that happen? Is it possible that you can have an 0-10 end game, uh, you know, in top lane and mid lane, and they AFK, or you just have three people on your team just like disconnect in a pat, like a, a thunderstorm? They have a power outage or something like that. Yes, of course, obviously, right? That happens to everybody, right? That happens even to challengers. That happens um, all the way down to bronze five, right? So that is very obvious that that can happen. But the, the question that we're examining here is, is your rank over time by the end of a season, is that luck? Okay, so there can be unlucky games. Yes, of course, obviously. Anyone who's played for any, League for any length of time can see that there are some games that are unwinnable. That's just all there is to it. There are always ways you can play better as a player, but... I think it's a bit naive or disingenuous to say that every single game is winnable with every single lineup. That's just not going to happen because there, there's just a lot of variance in the games, you know, depending on which champions people pick, which strategies they execute, whether or not someone disconnects. I mean, the Power Storm thing, that's happened to me. I've had, you know, uh, two people at least in a game disconnect and just never come back because they were duo queued at the same university somewhere. Um, and there is a... A thunderstorm and they both just dc'd it was 3v5 they had a much higher scaling team they won so there are some games where if it's not like a zero percent chance it's an extremely low percent chance that you can win the game okay so is that unlucky sure because that's outside of your control as a player there's nothing you can do about those dcs there's nothing you can do sometimes about someone going 0 and 10 in lane sometimes there is something you can do about that and we'll talk about that later um but there are definitely some things that are outside of your control. Okay, so if a game can be unlucky, if a game can be extremely low probability to win due to circumstances outside your control, then is the overall rank, is the entire league ladder luck? No. The answer is unequivocally no. And we're going to talk about why that is. So there will be individual games which you will express very little agency. You will have very little control over the game. People will call this carry. Is it carryable? 
Um, and the answer is no. Sometimes you won't. Like, even if you dropped Faker into Bronze 5 and had him climb up the Challenger in North American Server, he's going to lose some games. I'll guarantee you he will not have a perfect score, but he will have a very high chance. Um, and the reason is because he's doing things to minimize variance. He's doing things so that he has the maximum skill expression and he is really trying to become a better player and express his skill to win games. Okay? So the main reason that it can't all be luck for every individual is because there is one constant in every single game. Okay? So over the course of hundreds of games, you are in every single game. That's one factor that is in every game. That's you. And so that means you are the determining factor into whether or not you get out of this. So, you know, is it luck? Like, if you just go into Champion Select and you were to watch 100 games and you knew nothing about any player, you knew nothing about picks, you knew nothing about bands, you're just looking right there and you're just trying to call it. I mean, I guess if you're thinking about blue side or red side, blue side might be slightly favored sometimes. I don't know. But even if you didn't know the sides where the teams are and you just have five people lined up that are silver five and five other people lined up that are silver five and you guess which team wins, you don't know the names. You're just saying team A or team B. You don't know their side. You don't know the names. You don't know the champions they pick or banned. Um, would the average over you know 100 guesses probably be 50%? Yes, because that is luck. Because you don't know anything about e any of the players or the champions they pick or ban or anything like that. But when you're in every game, you know something. You know you. You know the champions that you're picking. You know the strategies that you're going to use. You also have other information. You know the players on your team. You can use something like op.gg, um, which I'll show you right here. You can copy-paste all of their names. So if we just type, like, I don't know. Carl Smith Mike or whatever, right? You can look up these people and see what their win rates are. Okay, you can see the champions that they play. You can see the champions you're picking. You have information about your team comp. You have information about the enemy team comp. You have information about bands. You don't know who the enemy players are, so you can't look them up until you're into a game. But you have a wide variety of information that gives you predictive power. So you know yourself. You know what you're going to play. You know what you're going to do. You know what your allies are going to play. Um, there are a lot of variables here okay, that you can understand and interpret and use for uh creating predictions about what the outcome of the game is going to be and you're able to dodge we'll talk about that later in a game too so you are the constant in every game you can interpret all of this information you can decide if you want to dodge or not you can also decide which champions you want to play you can also communicate with your team so you can ask them which champions are you guys playing um you could notice hey somebody plays twitch a lot you could say hey twitch is open i heard he's really powerful and try to get your ally to pick twitch or you could tell your team maybe someone's about to lock in a fourth ad champion they're about to lock in zed they're just on autopilot you can type in whoa we have all ad can we have an ap mid please and they might say oh you know i, I forgot that okay i'll play cassidy instead Right? So they may not. They may tell you, whatever, I'm going to play Zed. But if you communicate, you can influence the decisions of at least some team members over the course of hundreds of games. So you have all of this knowledge. You have the ability to influence it through communication, through your picks, through pick, um, dodging if you want to. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can influence this. So it is not random. It is not a coin flip over time because these are variables that you can predict right, and that you can interact with to some extent. Okay? So think about it this way. If luck determined rank, then at least some pro players would be distributed in bronze and silver, right? So if you just want to think of it on a very basic scale, just like dice roll um, one to six, okay? So let's just say that... Um, let's just say, okay, it's all luck. So we'll just say one to six, one is bronze, two is silver, three is gold, four is platinum, five is diamond, six is masters and seven is challengers so we'll do one to seven okay let's just take double lift for example um if it's completely luck based we're just going to roll it one to seven here and just see where he ends up seven okay so he is challenger all right let's look at i'm a cutie pie where's he gonna end up oh i'm a cutie pie he's only gold let's see where did he end up
Wait, hold on a minute. This guy's challenger. How, how did that... Hold on. He's been challenger every single season? Man, this guy should go play the lottery. He's so lucky. This is crazy. Like, what? It was a 1-7 to seven chance, so... Let's see. 7 to the 4th times 7 times 7 times 7, right? So he has a 1-7 chance. That's a 1 in... 2,400 chance this guy could be challenger four seasons in a row. That's that's really lucky, right? No, it's not, right? Like, you will see the same pro players and the same people who are challengers season after season after season get into challenger. And there's no way that's possible if it's strictly luck in solo queue, right? Just like if you look at professional poker players, there are certain poker players at major tournaments that often end up doing very well. They may not win the entire tournament every season, or every whatever poker grouping i guess i don't remember what the the huge poker tournaments are called anymore but i haven't watched that in a while um but it's not luck because if it was luck there would be bronze or silver challenger and pro level players that could not get out of bronze and silver because it's just strictly luck right it's just coin flips um and also there would be no discernible difference in pro and bronze play and pro play you could put bronze and challenger players since it's all luck wherever everyone ends up you could just put them in the same game i mean you could just put double lift in a game against someone who just got the game yesterday and of course they would perform roughly the same i mean it'd be hard to tell who's gonna win um in that game right because there's no difference it's all luck Right. And um, no one would be able to predict the outcome of a game. So we could take five, you know, bronze five players, put them on one team. We could take five challengers, put it on, on another team. And we would all be bewildered. We'd have no idea who to pick. You know, if you were betting on this, if you had to put a hundred dollars on a game, I mean, it'd be a really tough decision to figure out who's going to win because it's all luck, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't make any logical sense. Right. Of course, pro players are not going to be hard stuck bronze right and you know certainly not on a random level where there's going to be multiple people down there right um and y there is predictive power you can predict people based on the rank like yes sometimes people underperform in individual games you'll have you know platinum level people that you know could in theory lose a lane to a gold level person or they could make some really bad decisions in a certain game and be really bad or you could have a pro level player who misses a flash over a wall maybe a bronze player can make that flash over that same wall if they're sitting there doing it and they might sit there and think ha that pro player is terrible because they missed this uh you know flash over this wall or they missed this skill shot i've made that skill shot before um so of course i'm better than you know jensen because i hit this skill shot off of uh you know, whatever champion off of Zerath or something. And I just saw him miss a Q. I I've hit a Q before. So therefore I'm better than Jensen. You know, there's a lot of logical fallacies that go into this, right? Like, yes, pro players are going to make mistakes. And yes, sometimes people in certain ranked divisions are going to make mistakes and potentially could get outperformed by people in lower brackets. I mean, I, um, a duoed with a guy named Nasty just as a promotional thing that he asked me to do and I said that sounds like fun let's do it he emailed me he's a challenger level support player we played um gold level games he was on a smurf we only went 50 50 in those games and he there was one game where he played Shivana and he went 0 and 4 as Shivana early on in the jungle right like he made a lot of a lot of mistakes but he was playing his off roll he may not have been focused up all the way. He might have just been taking more risks because he's on his smurf and it's fun. But I'll guarantee you, if we dropped him off, you know, in gold or silver or bronze or whatever, he would find his way out of it, even though he's making a lot of mistakes. So the bottom line here is, you know, that it it cannot be luck because the same because you have the pro level people always end up in challenger or at least high diamond, depending on how often they play solo queue. Um, you can there you can tell a difference between bronze and pro play over many games and games do have predictive value depending on which players are on them right um okay so how is this happening and how can you control luck then how can you control this variance to climb all right and this is statistically how it works so in a series of ranked games over time each player just assume they'll have a 50 percent chance to outperform the opposing player. Like I said, if you knew nothing about either player on either team and 
you just put you know five silver players against five silver players it's going to be a 50 percent that one team's going to win over the other if you watched you know 300 games of that so that means that whenever you play a game the top lane has a 50 percent chance to win the jungle has a 50 percent chance mid and 80 carry if you're the support role has a 50 percent chance to win right over time if you even out all of your games i'll guarantee you if you watched it you know it would be pretty close to 50% how often your jungler wins versus their jungler over 500 games or how often your top lane wins versus their top lane. Just in real simplistic, like, one-on-one -on -one sort of ways, right? But the one thing you can control is yourself. And so if you overperform your role a lot, so let's say that you win 70% of the time, right? So however you want to measure that against the enemy support, right? Maybe you pressure more, maybe you provide more vision maybe you're picking better champions for your team comp maybe you're shot calling better for your team um whatever it is let's just say that you're overperforming the other support 70 percent of the time so that means that 30 percent of the time even if you're in a lower bracket 30 percent of the time um you know they might overperform you but you're overperforming 70 percent how that works out statistically you do 50 times four okay 50 percent times four then you have your 70 percent you add that in there you divide the whole thing by five. I'll do it right here for you on the calculator, okay? 50 times four, okay, plus 70, all right? Then you find the average. So how often would you win games on average? You divide it by five, 54%. So if you are overperforming your lane, even 70% of the time, we're not even talking you play perfect every single game and it's 100%. We're just talking 70% of the time. You would have a 54% win rate. So that means that, you know, roughly every 100 games that you play or so, you would climb about 80 LP for a division, right? You'd be four wins over losses. Um, so you'd gain like 80 LP. Okay, if you get that up to 55%, then you would gain a division every time you played 100 games. So if you played 500 games like that over time, you would probably go from, you know, gold five to platinum one. Be very close to that. Five, 600, 700 games, something like that, right? Over time, as you play more games, if you consistently do that, you will climb. I mean, any number that's over 50%, you are climbing. You may not climb super fast, but you will move up. Okay? So if you truly do outperform your counterpart, if you truly are playing better than other people in your game, statistically, you will climb. But you have to keep in mind also that... 54% does not guarantee an equal distribution. It's not going to be, you know, win-loss, 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 you know, for a lot of games. And occasionally you get win-win-loss, win-win-loss, win-loss, win-loss, win-loss. Like, it doesn't have to happen like that. You could, in theory, lose 46 games in a row and still have a 54% win rate after 100 games if you win your next 54 in a row. Okay, now is that probable? No, but it's possible. If you have a 50% or a 54% win rate, that could happen. Nothing says it has to be equal distribution. So you can still climb and go on really bad loss streaks every now and then. That's not preferable, but it could happen. So it doesn't mean that, you know, solo queue is really unlucky. If you just look at how these games distribute and you play like 1,000 games in a season, 1,500 games in a season, you will have a loss streak. Okay, that's not unlucky. That's probable given how many games you're playing, okay? So it doesn't mean that it has to be distributed evenly, okay? And there's other problems with lost streaks, which we'll talk about here in a second, in terms of, like, the mental end and in terms of the MMR end. Um, but overall, if you have a higher than a 50% win rate, you will climb, okay? And you can get a climbable win rate off of just overperforming 70% of your games, Okay, now that is a very simple example. Though. That's just assuming one on one, you know, you outperform the support and then the 80 carry and everyone else just breaks even half the time. Okay, but it's much more complicated than that. And that is how challengers, boosters, all of these people can have really high win rates and low elo because it's not a coin flip in every single lane. Right. So overall, your climb is not a coin flip. You could say each other player is a coin flip, right? So some people would say that, oh, well, whether your top lane wins or whether your mid lane wins is a coin flip, but it's not because you can have agency over them too because you're not just squaring off with the support. It's, this isn't just five one-on-ones happening on a map. You can interact with other players on the map, right? So if you get ahead bot lane, right? Let's say that you beat out your support 
Um, you're getting really good vision control. You can go invade the jungle with your jungler and perhaps, you know, steal some of their camps, maybe deny a buff, maybe even kill the enemy jungler. If you have really good vision and you're completely stomping your lane bot, you can do that. So now, you know, maybe the jungle was going to be 50-50, depending on skill, but now maybe you just pushed it into, you know, 70% territory by denying the enemy experience, taking dragons, um, counter ganking, like maybe you see that their jungler is getting ready to gank mid lane and you are an Alistar bot lane with mobility boost. Maybe you start running up that river after you push in your lane and then you show up and influence that fight mid lane. So you're taking agency away from their jungler. You're taking them out of the game by imposing your will on them, by taking your strength that you have bot lane and your game knowledge and augmenting your jungler and your mid lane to help them win their lane. Okay, to help them win the game. So it's no longer 50-50. It's becoming even closer. And especially a support with the AD carry, you know, if you're outperforming the support, if you're going 70% over performance, then you should be helping your AD carry perform really well too. Right? So if you are completely dominating the bot lane, then your AD carry should have an easier time last hitting. They should have better protection. So if they're out of position a lot, depending on your support and everything else that's going on. You might be able to protect them better. Like, maybe they're a player who buys the right items and who plays really high-scaling good champions like Jinx or Tristana, but maybe they're just out of position a lot. And so if you can direct them, if you can tell them, hey, back up, or if you can get there and peel for them better with Alistar or Tom Kench or Janna or whatever, then maybe you're turning them into a 70% player because the reason they're 50% is because they're out of position or because they don't know where to go on the map because they have bad macro or whatever the case may be. You can influence all of this stuff in a game through shot calling, through rotations, through intelligent like interpretation of game states and itemization, through um, better champion select. Right, like You can influence all of this, and we'll talk about how you do that here in a second. But I just want to be clear that this is not a series, like League is not five 1v1s. It's a 5v5, which means that you can have agency over players. And this is something that MidBeast talks about a lot too, and I'll give him a shout out. He has great content on his channel, and he talks about Apto specifically. And Apto is largely hailed as the greatest solo queue player in the world. He is a Korean, um, I think, I don't remember why exactly. I don't know the history of Apto. But I believe that he is banned. I think he's banned from pro play, and he might be banned in certain solo queue matchups. And then he plays. Um, so I think he's kind of like the Tyler one of Korea, sort of. Uh, not exactly the same way, but in the fact that he has to sneak around and constantly make uh, Smurf accounts to play. I think it might have been because he was boosting a lot. I'm not entirely sure, though. But the bottom line is MidBeast talks about Apto all the time, and this guy gets, like, regularly, like, 90% plus win rates in solo queue. Like, he'll start off in bronze or silver, and he'll have 90% win rates. Okay, and that certainly looks like that would be impossible, right? So even if he overperforms, like, let's say he's the mid laner, and he wins his mid lane 100% of the time, and everybody else is 50%, right? So if we go, you know, the 50 times 4, it gives us 200 and then plus 100, he wins 100% of the time in his 1v1 matchup. Divided by 5, that would only give him a 60% win rate. So if he wins every single time mid lane and just lets everyone else do their thing on the map and go 50-50, he would only win 60%. But he's winning... or he Yeah, he would only win 60, but he's winning 90% on some of these smurfs. 90%. So, I mean, what would that number have to be? That would have to be if you think of each player. You know, you'd have to get to 450. I don't even know. So if he's winning 90%, I mean, I think that means he, like, he has to turn every single person on the team into a 90% winner in order for him to win 90%. Basically. So even if he wins 100% of the time... Let's see, if everyone's 85, that's not even enough. Even if every, even if he makes everyone else on his team win 85% of the time, and he wins 100%, I think. I do that right. 85 times 4 plus 100. Yeah, it's still not enough. So he has to turn all of his 50% people on his team, which they are 50%. If he wasn't in the game, they would each only have a 50% chance to win. 
right? Just remember, blind pick. You don't know anything about any players. You're just randomly taking a silver two game. It's going to be 50-50 over the course of hundreds of games. So he's turning these 50% players into 90% players, not just himself, but every single person in the game has to become a 90% win rate player in order for him to climb like this over time. Just let that sink in. You're taking all of these people that are 50% players and you're turning them into 90%. So that means that he's not just saying, oh, well, it's lucky or unlucky. I guess I'll win my lane 100% of the time and I'm just going to let everyone else go 50-50. No, he's not content with that. He goes around the map and he influences every single lane. He roams bottom lane. He turns that into a winning lane. He roams the jungle. He turns that into a winning lane. He goes top lane. He turns that into a winning lane. You know, he shot calls. He rotates. Um... He just completely dominates. And this is why in my one-trick video, I say that champions like Talia and TF are the best one-tricks for mid lane a lot of the time because they have such a high ability to influence other lanes. In order for you to win, in order for you to move away from the luck model of climbing, in order to move away from coin flips, um, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to influence other lanes. So he's taking these coin flips and he's just snatching those coins out of the air and he's just slamming them on the desk saying, no, it's going to be heads every single time. And if it's heads, I win. So that's what you have to do. You have to grab those coin flips out of the air and just slam them on the desk and say, no, I am determining this outcome. It's going to be heads. I called it and we're winning. Okay. So that's how you have to do it. You can't see yourself as a victim. You can't say, oh, you know, it's a coin flip. You know, it seems like half of my top laners always feed or half my mid laners always feed. No, you have to figure out how to go control them, how to get agency in the game. Okay. And he does it. And just so watch some of Mid Beast video. He breaks down, he talks about how Apto does this. He has a whole series about these. He has like five different games where he looks at Apto and he talks about Apto's pick. And uh, Mid Beast is a challenger level player, I think, in Oceana. Um, so just watch some of his content. It's pretty good if you want to know specifically how Apto's doing it with TF. But I'm going to tell you more specifically how you can do it from any role here in just a second. All right. But I want to talk about just a little bit more time because the psychology of league and i'm not going to spend a ton of time on this but a little bit because it is important to understand why people feel this way because you have to move past your mental blocks your mental barriers before you can move towards true progress okay and that's really really important and that's not just for league that's for anything we'll be focusing on it with league so why does ranked feel unlucky then okay so i can agree that sometimes ranked can feel unlucky I can definitely agree with that, right? I've been on a lot of lost streaks, especially recently. Um, and it can feel really unlucky. You know, you get three, you know, you have five games in a row where you have an AFK or someone who feeds 0 and 10 or all of these other things going on in your games. And you're just like, you know, I feel like there's nothing I could do in those games. And sometimes there's not. Remember, there can be unlucky games. Apto does lose games. He does not have a 100% win rate. Even as the best solo queue player in the world, even as someone with a 90% win rate, which is staggering, considering that he's playing up like through bronze, silver, gold, platinum, all that stuff, um, you can have unlucky games, right? And those games can come in streaks over the course of hundreds or thousands of games, right? So it can feel unlucky, but why is this? Why can't we just say, okay, you know, that's just statistical variance, okay, um... You know, whatever, I could have improved my play this way or that way. Like, what is hard about that? Okay, so the number one thing that holds people back mentally is cognitive dissonance, okay? This is a really important term to, like, understand both in terms of league and just other things in life, okay? So cognitive dissonance is basically where you feel mentally uncomfortable because um, you're holding two conflicting views at the same time, okay? So that is possible in the brain. There are a lot of different sides to different arguments or different interpretations of events in the world. And if you hold two conflicting views, your brain will feel discomfort because you're not going to have a unified identity. You're going to be split, right? Because part of you is going to believe one thing and part of you is going to believe another thing. Your brain does not like that. Your brain likes to feel like it has a unified singular identity, um, which is very problematic. I talk about that in my class uh, at the university a couple of times. We're talking about rhetoric and you know understanding the self and audience values and things like that but for this purpose what this means is you think you're better if you think that you're better than everybody else in your games but you're constantly losing the games that is going to create cognitive dissonance 
okay? Because what's actually happening, the losses do not align with what you think should be happening, which are wins, okay? Because you're better. So, you know, like, your brain knows you can't be better if you're constantly losing, right? Or that's, you know, that's going to create some tension there, which that's not necessarily true, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, but this creates a problem. And so you have to resolve this. Like your mind will want to resolve this. Okay. So the easiest way to resolve this is just to say that it's luck, right? Just to say, okay, I am better than other people, but it's just really unlucky because I had this feeder because I had, you know, all this other stuff on my team going on. It's just really unlucky. You know, that's the easiest thing to say because you just say luck. It doesn't require any rationale or justification. It's just straight up luck. And then that, boom, dissonance disappeared. You are better, but you are losing because of luck, right? And that is the easiest, in many ways, the laziest way to do things. And that's how your body and your mind likes it. Your body likes it the laziest way. Your, you know, your mind likes really lazy, easy answers most of the time because it takes a lot less to process and there's a lot less of a chance that you're going to experience more cognitive dissonance, right? So this is why your brain likes really fatty foods. For example, it's a ton of calories that are relatively easy to digest and boom, you get it. And that's why if we just all go around and that's why things taste good, you know, biologically, evolutionarily, like a lot of things that taste good are not good for you. And it's because, you know, we have evolved to really like the easiest stuff that's going to give us the most calories, the simple sugars, the fats and stuff like that, because it's a lot of calories and, um, it just gives us energy so we don't starve in the winter. You know, if you think historically about like cavemen and things like that, um, that just makes sense why you would make certain things like that tasty because your body wants you to eat them a lot because they are going to give you a ton of calories really easily. Okay, your mind is the same thing. It wants to eat the sugar. It wants to eat the fatty stuff, right? Which is the really simple, easy stuff that just, you know, makes you feel good or makes you feel better, right? Just gives you this temporary high. Um, so there's, you know, there's not anything inherently wrong with that. That's just how kind of a lot of us naturally are, right? We want the easiest thing to process. Okay. But that is not good for climbing. That is not good for solo queue. That's not good for your health. Also, if you eat a lot of sugars and fats all the time, right? Sometimes you got to sneak in, um, you know, some stuff that doesn't taste as good, some healthier stuff. Um, but yeah, many it, you know many people believe they're better than others, and yet most people are going to revert back to this fifty percent average win rate. That's how an ELO ranked system works. Okay, so our minds crave consistency, and our mental tendency is to accept the easiest explanation. So it's a lot easier to blame others rather than to improve ourselves. To blame others, or to call it luck, or whatever, and therefore we avoid responsibility in order to resolve cognitive dissonance. This is the biggest thing. Is and that's why I wanted to do this video. Part of it is that this notion, if you think that there is luck out there, you are not going to become a better player because you're not taking responsibility for the agency that you do have. So you can acknowledge you're not going to have full agency over everything. You can't control everything in a game. There will be some games that are unwinnable. Um, but uh, there are a lot of things you can control and a lot more that people can control than they think they can control. Once again, we'll talk about that here in the back half of the video. But... Um, that's why it's so insidious. That's why it's so dangerous. And that's why I feel like anytime people start talking about this, you know, I have to disagree whenever I can. I have to try to explain this stuff because it stops people from improving, right? Just think about if this mindset applied to, well, it actually does apply to a lot of things outside of league, sadly, where people will complain about a lot of things. Um, they'll say it's outside of their control. They're a victim of some kind of circumstances. Um, and so they're evading personal responsibility for what's going on and this is all you know i would venture to say this happens to some extent in all countries all cultures all socio demographics just everywhere just people all around the world all the time it's just easier to resolve the cognitive dissonance why you're having problems in league or other parts in your life by saying that it's something akin to unlucky or blaming others or whatever for whatever situation you're in okay so it's not just league it's everywhere but there are a lot of problems with that and it involves a lot of logical fallacies. So a lot of people use the affirming the consequent to misinterpret the current statistical trend as an indicator of future outcomes. So if you look at this logical fallacy here, 
especially example number two. Arguments of the same form can be can seem superficially convincing, as in the following. If I had been thrown off the top of the Eiffel Tower, then I am dead. I am dead, therefore I had been thrown off the Eiffel Tower. So it kind of seems convincing, right? But it's assuming the consequent, right? It's assuming the final result in the actions when there could be a lot of other explanations, right? So being thrown off the top of the Eiffel Tower is not the only cause of death since there exists numerous different causes of death. For instance, one could die from a fatal stab, heart attack, so on and so forth. So affirming the consequent is commonly used in rationalization and thus appears as a coping mechanism to some people, okay? So there are a lot of logical fallacies out there, and this is one of them that happens a lot in League. So how this would look in League is... If League is luck, League is luck if I play well and lose three games in a row. I played well and lost three games, therefore League is luck. Okay? So you're kind of writing the consequence in here. You're saying, if I lose three games, this has to be the reasoning. It has to be luck. Okay? But there are a lot of other reasons you can lose the game other than this reason that we've just arbitrarily decided on here, which is luck. Just like there could be other ways to die other than arbitrarily thinking about falling off the Eiffel Tower. Right? Hasty generalization is another one. Um, and that's where you take a small trend of data and you use that to justify a larger trend. So hasty generalization um, by reaching inductive generalization based on insufficient evidence. So some of the um, examples that I used here or that people say here, if a person travels through a town for the first time, sees 10 people and they're all children, the person might conclude everyone in this town is a child because that's all they've seen. Or for example, if you met someone who was really mean from Wisconsin, you know, at a football game or something, and maybe, you know, his friends were mean and there were three mean people from Wisconsin, you might think all people from Wisconsin are mean, right? And this is once again, something that our brain does. Our brain tries to categorize through experience so that we have predictive power for the future, right? But sometimes it goes too far. It takes a small sample size to represent an entire population, right? So there's this mean person from Wisconsin, therefore everyone's mean from Wisconsin. This doesn't just have to be negative either. Like maybe we read a, met a really nice, friendly person from India and we just assume that everyone in India is friendly, right? I mean, stereotypes, this is what stereotypes are, <laughs> basically. So that's part of it. But you see that in League as well, right? We'll see, okay, I had three really bad mid laners in a row. Um, they cost me the game, they failed, so everyone is bad in solo queue at this ELO and it's just luck to win. It's like, no, you just had three people who really underperformed. Okay, that doesn't mean that everyone will forever and always, right? You just got, you know, unlucky in a couple of games. But does that mean the entire climb is luck? No. Okay? So there's a difference in luck over a small time trend, you know, believing that there are things outside of your control, which there are. But over time, once again, you will be the determining factor because you are the only constant in every single game, unless you have a duo. Okay? So luck in this scenario is statistical variance. It's not necessarily indicative of a long-term trend over a larger sample size. You can read about statistical variance here too. This is actually pretty mathematical in here. Um, unfortunately, I wish they would explain this without as much math, but if you like math, boom, there it is, statistical variance. All that says is that, you know, there can be an average, you know, the average is 50%, but there can be variance as well, right? Like you might go, even if you're a 50% player, you might go on a 10 game win streak. You might go on a 10-game loss streak. Um, you know, over time, if you did a statistical analysis, you could actually say sort of what the boundaries are, what's likely to happen in certain scenarios with certain probabilities. But that doesn't mean that it's going to happen that way every single time. Um, and, like, the main thing that... So we've got cognitive dissonance. We've got all these logical fallacies. Another major reason that games can feel unlucky is because people don't understand what they need to do to improve. So maybe they're making all of these mistakes or all of, they have all of these inefficiencies in a game. Maybe they're not rotating when they could. I mean, a lot of the mistakes are the ones that we never see, right? So it's not something that you do that's wrong. It's something that you could have done that you didn't do, okay? So a lot of league is unseen, Okay, and this makes it very difficult for people to understand how they can control it. So, for example, the mid lane has a really bad matchup. They go 0-2. You're Alistar, bottom. You're completely crushing bottom lane, and you might just sit there and keep crushing bot lane. 
right? Instead of rotating middle to help the mid laner out so that they don't keep feeding, all right? And this happens a lot, a lot. I remember one game where we won last night. Um, <laughs> when you walk in, la uh, or when I was playing last night, um, there's a guy, we were completely crushing bot lane. I was Zyra, and there's a Varus bot lane. And we took the tower at like seven minutes, seven or eight minutes. And he was just like, man, I think we took the tower too early or whatever. And so there's this thought in League where if you're completely dominating your lane, you should keep dominating it. You should just keep denying CS to the tower, not take it, and then just keep winning your lane. Most of the time, that is wrong. You need to get your advantage and go take it to other lanes to snowball. That's the secret of Apto. That's how he does it. You take it. You take your power to other lanes and you exert your influence. You force those coin flips, right? You grab them out of the air. You slam them on the table. And that's what we did. We ran mid lane. We got mid tower. Then we got dragon. Then we got uh, rift herald. Then we got top. Then we had a large control over their area of the map. I started getting a lot of wards in there. Then we started getting picks in their jungle. We picked off their Warwick in the jungle. We picked off their mid laner who was trying to rotate top to pick off our top laner. Um, so we just got a lot of vision. We shut them out of their resources. We started taking more of their jungle. We got more dragons. We got more damage on towers. And we just snowballed and ended the game in 22 minutes. Now, if we had kept going the way that maybe this Varus wanted to go, which was just sit there and farm it out in lane... You know, maybe we deny a few more CS to bot lane. Maybe we keep beating them. We go up another 10 or 15 CS. Um, but maybe top lane, or maybe top lane dies a couple of times there. Or maybe the mid lane all of a sudden starts lagging. You know, maybe the game goes on to like 35 minutes and our mid laner lags out. Or maybe, um, you know, our top laner is really good at laning and really good at playing with a lead. I think it was a ribbon. But then if... She doesn't know how to switch gears. So then if we go to 30 minutes, she doesn't really know how to team fight. Maybe she just keeps like AFK split pushing top and they find opportunities to pick us off. So we're just giving more time for variance the longer a game goes on. So if, if you could end a game in 22 minutes and you instead take 35 minutes, you're opening yourself up to a lot more chances to lose because these things could happen. Someone could just be out of position. Someone could DC. Someone could just like not know how to transition into the late game mentality and you see this all the time in silver and gold games right it's like it's 35 minutes we just got baron and the jungler goes to go pick up a gromp or your mid laner says hold on guys let me go get blue or your adc says hold on let me go get red and then someone's like not paying attention and you know your top laner tries to push up middle gets caught killed then all of a sudden it's a 4v5 now you have to wait an additional minute for that person to spawn and get back to mid lane and then while that's going on, maybe your uh, AD carry tries to go far in bot lane. They get caught. Now you have to wait another minute. And so the game gets drawn out because people don't know how to transition into late game. And the late game and rotations are much harder to understand than laning. So it's much more likely that people are going to make more mistakes on your team if the game goes later than if you close it out early. So that is something you can control. You can shot call. You can close out games faster. Right, So it doesn't just have to be, oh, well, it's 45 minutes. Whoever wins this team fight, I guess it's just luck. You know, Whoever catches somebody else, no. You could have closed it out in 25 minutes with your lead if you just got out of your lane and used your lead in other lanes. Right? But press your advantage. Okay, so let's talk about a couple final ways that you can reduce luck in your games. Um, so I've talked about several already, but I want to talk about it just a little bit more. And I have videos about this, a lot of videos about these types of things on the channel if you want to check them out. So I linked my better macro video, better macro video, better micro video, and champion select video. So I'm just going to hit the highlights of those really quickly. And if that seems interesting to you, if you want to know more about that, then check out those videos. You know, each one of them is probably about an hour long with really good timestamps, just like this one. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to add on an extra three hours to cover everything that I talk about in these videos, but I'll give you a simple preview, um, just for ways that you could influence luck, right? Okay. So if we think about macro and these are just the Google docs, there's like full videos for these as well. Okay. Um, so if we think about macro, one of the big ways is to think about what is your win condition? How do you actually win the game? And this can help you influence luck and you have to switch gears and play around your win condition, okay? You need to play around your strength and avoid the enemy strength, okay? This is going to increase your chances of winning the game. So it's not luck, it's a chance, and it's something that you have agency over, okay? You can decide 
especially as a support player, where do you want to put your resources, right? Like, if you have a Knight's Vow, who do you use Knight's Vow on? Do you use it on your AD carry? Do you use it on your mid laner? Do you use it on your jungler? You don't always have to use it on your AD carry, even though they're the person you're laning with. And you can switch it. Like, it's, you know, whenever the cooldown is off on that item, you can switch it to a different champion. Or like your exhaust, who are you going to exhaust, right? Are you going to exhaust the Shivana that's trying to dive your AD carry on the back line? Are you going to exhaust the um, Echo that's trying to pick off your mid laner? You can choose how to do this, right? Or Locket or Redemption. When are you going to use those abilities? You have control over who you're trying to protect. Who are you going to use your ultimate to protect if you're Janna? Who are you going to eat if you're Tom Kench? Like, you need to be understanding your win conditions, how you win, and understanding the game state, which I think is something that I talk about. I think I talk about it right here in the game state in the video. But press tab, look, okay? Um, if you're Nasus, like, maybe Nasus is one of your win conditions. So if you look and think, okay, how do we win this game? We could win by a Nasus split push, because he's a really good split pusher. We could win by Sona in a team fight. Um... We could win by Cassident in a pit comp, so by catching people out in the jungle or in the river. We could win by Ezreal with a siege or Caitlyn. We just try to poke them down and win that way. So there are a lot of different ways you can win. And a lot of times teams won't draft coherent strategies, so they won't pick a really good all poke comp or a really good all team fight comp. It does happen, but not always. Okay? And so you have to choose, well, what's the best win condition? What's going to give us our best chance to win? And sometimes that changes over time. So maybe you had been thinking, okay, Gnosis is our was our primary way to win, but he's gone 0 and 5 in lane, top lane, and Kane is 6 and 0 in our jungle. So maybe going into the game, I had thought, okay, I'm gonna play around Gnosis. I'm gonna get items that are really good with him. I'm gonna use my Knight's Vow on him. I'm gonna give him a bunch of wards. Um you know, to help him split push. I'm going to, you know, use exhaust to help him out in lane. I'm going to use Mikhail's to cleanse off some crowd control on him. But now that he's 0-5, we have a Kane that's 6-0 on our team. So I have to adjust. I have to say, oh, okay, Kane's doing really well. So he's our main win condition now. So maybe we have to try to go for a pit comp style. So if we're going pit comp, maybe it would be better if I got something like um, a Knight's Vow instead of a Locket because we probably won't be team fighting as much. And then that will be better in skirmishes with Kane right or maybe we don't have another tank and maybe i wanted to go um redemption locket on Tarek or something to start with for really strong team fighting but now that our main tank is 0 and 5 or maybe even if he's not 0 and 5 maybe he's 0 and 1 but he's building like full damage like he's going infinity edge gnosis or something then maybe i'm thinking okay well i guess i have to build tank now because he's either really far behind or he's building goofy items and so maybe now i can't buy locket and i have to buy something like knight's vow <coughs> So you need to constantly tab and just assess, like, who's doing well? Who do I need to use my resources on? What do I need to do to adjust to help our team win? Do I need to build tankier? Do I need a McHale's because the crowd control is killing us? Um, do I need Banner of Command because we're going to have a really hard time pushing through that Anivia mid lane because they have so much wave clear? Maybe we need extra side lane pressure. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do to influence the game but a lot of it is playing around your win conditions and then choosing how you're rotating who you're playing around you know which items you're getting all of that stuff is part of macro that helps you understand how to win around your win condition okay um and just paying attention to item thresholds which is very similar you know if their ad carry has completed infinity edge and yours hasn't you probably should not fight a 2v2 right it depends on the champions but if they are ahead in items, don't fight them. I mean, there's an example of a game yesterday where we had a Lucian who uh, dove under mid tower, died, like literally flash, like dove under mid tower at level three, died. They pushed up another wave, came back to lane. Um, then he immediately walked up, tried to fight them again. You know, I tabbed looked saw that our lucian had a long sword and there uh i don't remember what it was might have been a a gen i think it was a gen had a bf sword right and i was pinging him back i pinged him back like three or four times but he was trying to fight 
And then, um, you know, he died, of course. And I managed to get out of there. And then he's just like, dude, why didn't you follow me? We totally had that. And I said, because he had a BF sword and we had a long sword. And he, you know, I don't remember what else he said after that. But he clearly, like, is not paying attention to the game state. So you just have to notice things like that. You have to notice, okay, they have more items than we do. We can't fight. League is not a linear game in the sense that every character is always equal to every other character. Things scale over time according to items. So it's not like a game of chess where a pawn is always a pawn or a knight is always a knight. I guess pawns can scale if they get to the other side of the board, but, you know, it's not like the pieces are always the same, right? A bishop doesn't all, you know, a bishop always has these movement choices. You know, a knight always has these movement choices. It's always the same piece. And that's not the same in League. You know, a vein with zero items is not the same as a vein with six items. You have to treat her very, very differently. And there are a lot of champions that are like that. Where, you know, their different power spikes, where they're strong, change according to the champion and how they itemize in the team comp. So you need to be pressing tab to look at that kind of stuff. Okay, another way is to shot call the right objectives that you can control. So after your team wins a team fight, go say, hey, let's go take these towers. Hey, let's go um, get Baron. Let's go get Inhibitor. Let's go get Dragon. Like, you always want to get the safest and closest objective that you can. So it's a lot better if you get two kills instead of chasing down that third kill halfway through their jungle. Just let them go and get the tower. Okay, because ultimately kills don't matter as much as tower because towers are much more than gold. They're map advantage. They force the enemy to get back closer to their base, which makes it easier for you to get other objectives. You know, if they don't have the safety of their tier one mid tower, it's going to be a lot harder for them to defend dragon, for example, because um, they're going to have to walk further. If they get caught, they don't have that safety net that they can retreat to. Right, and so it's a lot more dangerous for them to move further, and it's going to be a lot harder for their support to ward near Dragon because they're not going to have that safety net. So the more you push them into their base, the more map advantage you gain, the easier it is for you to get even more map advantages because it snowballs. All right, so that's why it's so important to take towers. It's not just the gold that they provide. It's the um, tactical positioning that they don't provide for the enemy anymore. So they don't have those safety nets. You can advance your wards. You can challenge dragons, barons. You can bait people in bushes a lot easier. Um, you can rotate better because they're not going to know where you're going if you shut out all their vision when you're rotating up and down the river. Um, so shot calling the right objectives is very important, and you have to tell your team this, right? Um, doing things like not 50-50 baroning, telling your team, hey, Let's not do this. They are alive. Their Shaco is sitting right there on the other end of the Baron pit. Like, just telling people, do not do Baron. Okay? And then checking your items before you do something like a Baron or before you dive. Does your team have enough armor to dive? Does your team have enough armor for Baron? Do you do enough damage to take it fast enough? Does the enemy team have strong AoE? I mean, I've seen so many times where we'll have, like, a Kha'Zix jungle and, like, a Riven top... And, you know, just a bunch of squishy champions on a team, and people are calling Baron. Like, we kill one person. They're like, dude, go get Baron. We got it. And it's like 23 minutes. And I'm like, nobody has armor. And then they walk in there. They get hit three times by Baron. They're almost dead. And then they try to retreat, and the enemy team collapses and gets an ace. Right? So people just aren't understanding the items. Like, you have to have, you know, enough armor, and you have to have enough damage to do Baron safely before the enemy can reasonably contest you for that. Okay, so that's really important. So that's how you can control, you know, some of this luck. Again, right? You play around your win conditions. You shot call the right objectives. You control vision. Um, I'm not going to go too far into that. Just watch the video for more. But I talk specifically about how you control vision. That helps you make better decisions while you're shot calling. Um, and then you force favorable fights. So you look for those 4v5s. Okay, you see their AD carry, like, split pushing bottom randomly. You have a chance, if you're, you know, Alistar or Rakan or something like that, to start a fight. If you don't start that fight, that is a mistake most of the time. You know, it, it depends on what else is going on. But in that very basic scenario, that is a mistake. So you may not see that as a mistake as you're playing the game. You might think, oh, I'm playing the game perfectly. I didn't die. I'm just, you know, sitting here chilling. We're just farming it out. You know, even if you're behind, like maybe your team is behind like five or ten kills. But maybe that vain bot lane is 8-0. and o. She has 8 of the enemy kills. And so all of a sudden, if you were behind 5 kills, and their vain who has 8 kills is bot lane, if you fight 4v5, 
you're taking eight kills away from the enemy team because it's that person's not going to be there to fight. It's also a 4v5. So even though you're behind, I think sometimes people get into the mentality of, I just need to farm. We, you know, we can't do anything because we're behind. It's like, yes, you can if you see opportunities, right? So if you're sitting there as Rakan and you can start that fight and someone without teleport who's really important is down in the bot lane, fight. And it is a mistake for you not to fight. So if you lose that game, it might feel like, look, oh, geez, you know, this Jack's fed 0-5 top lane. We were down 15 kills in this game. You know, there's nothing I could do about that. It's like, yeah, there is. You could have fought when you had a chance to 4v5 and start a fight there. You could have done that. So, yes, it's not good that Jax went 0-5 top lane. But you had a chance to make a major play and potentially turn the game around. And you didn't do it because you didn't see it. Or you chose not to do it. Okay, so that's on you. Right? So it's all about taking responsibility like that for your actions and trying to see ways that you could have improved, that you could have influenced the outcome of the game. Okay, so it's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to notice that Jax goes 0-5 top lane. I would say don't say anything to him about it. But it's okay if you're frustrated. Sure, absolutely. But you just have to try to stay focused as much as you can and look for ways to get back into the game. You can't just automatically default to a certain mode, defensive farming, because you're behind. You have to be dynamic. You have to look at the tab you know, and try to f just think about all the ways that you could get back into the game. Okay, so forcing favorable fights is very important. And then communicating the maximum information to the team, right? So pinging cooldowns, pinging, uh, you know, enemy ultimates, pinging ally cooldowns. Like if your team's about to fight and your top laner has 20 seconds on teleport, ping people back and ping that teleport like three or four times. Say, don't fight, wait on teleport, you know, or maybe this happened the other day too. There was a cast we had that was 11 and 1 on our team and he was off farming gromp or blue buff or something random on the other side of the map and then near the bottom left um of the map on the enemy side um we were close to their inhibitor and our team was about to engage and try to fight them and i pinged them back i said no no don't fight i said no cast it and pinged it like four times they still fought um and we lost and that's how we lost the game so we basically three people died there three or four people and then they went and got baron and then Twitch had an additional, you know, the Baron bought Twitch an additional, you know, three or so minutes to farm up. And he got two kills in that fight. And then the game just became unwinnable. So we were doing a pretty good job, but they had higher scaling. They had Twitch. They had a zero on their team. And we just could not kill them at that point. We lost every team fight after that, and that was it. And we had been on a, we did have really good momentum. Um, so, yeah, it didn't work in that instance, but that's what you need to be doing. You need to be, you know communicating to the team to help them make good decisions okay so if they're making bad decisions they at least need to hear about it from you okay not in a negative way but in like a positive like hey let's not do this you know kind of way so you need to be shot calling in a positive way how do we look on time here like i said i don't want this to be super long but i'm just giving you a preview of these things so be sure to watch that macro guide if you want more details i have more examples for you in there of that type of stuff i'm um, to help you out Something else is the uh, better micro video that I have here. Once again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, just maybe like a few minutes. Um, but understanding the game state. So I talk about this again. So, you know, understanding, you know, there's a 5-0 and enemy Katarina hanging out on their back line. There's an 0-3 Vayne attacking your 3-0 and Malachi. And there's a 2-0 and Sejuani attacking your 4-0 and Jinx. Okay, so who do you ult? Okay, so you should probably hold your ult... Um, for the Katarina, and just use your green, so if you're Sona, and just use your green power cord on somebody else, okay? But if the Vayne were 5-0, and all right, and the Katarina were 0-3, you should probably ult the Vayne and save the green for the Katarina, okay? So this is a great example of dynamics, right, in micro and how you're choosing to interact in a very specific fight, how you're using your resources depending on the game state. So you're looking at macro to help inform your micro, Right, So if you waste your ult trying to peel this Malachi in a fight, that is a mistake. So you might think as Sona, well, I peeled my ADC, so that's good, right? Like, It's that stupid Fizz mid lane who fed this Katarina 5-0. That's the problem. It's like, yeah, that's a problem, but also the problem is you didn't crowd control the Katarina. You used it to peel for a Vayne who has no damage right now, who's 0-3. Okay, off of a pretty low damage threat with this Malachi that she's not going to kill anyways because he's probably going to have like Sunfire Cape at that point. So that is a mistake. So even though, you know, you might be thinking just the standard peel for the AD carry, you have to press tab and you have to think critically. Okay, the AD carry is not 
really our win condition right now. Maybe later, maybe if the game goes to 35 minutes, that changes and Vayne becomes relevant again. But right now, she's not. So the most relevant thing is to deny the enemy Katarina. Right, so it's to ult or crowd control the enemy Katarina. And there's so many times where people will mess this up. They'll use their exhaust on the wrong target or they'll use their ultimate on the wrong target. And I do that too. I do that too from time to time. I think we all do. But you need to be thinking carefully before you even get into the fight. What's your game plan? How are you going to micro this fight? Press tab. Who's strong? Okay, you see that Katarina. You need to be thinking, okay, I'm going to do everything in my power to stop this Katarina in this fight. I'm going to exhaust her. I'm going to ult her. I'm going to green shot her. I'm going to do everything to just shut her up as much as I can, right? And just because if I can deny that, then my team has the best chance to win the fight. So you can't do that on the fly if you're not pressing tab. You know, you can't just all of a sudden just think, oh, oops, like Katarina is the one who's really fed and killing everybody. Um... So you need to be actively reading and interpreting the game state so that you can make really good decisions. Okay? And that changes, right? Like if Vayne were 5-0 and and Katarina were 0-3, it would be the correct decision to peel the Vayne because she's your major win condition and Katarina is not going to be as much of a threat at that point. Okay? Um, to just who's strong on your team, who's strong on the enemy team, win condition, what's the enemy win condition, play around that. Improving your laning. So understanding the lane dynamics you can't always play a lane the same way and this is something that i always have to comment on you know on the channel especially if i'm on a lost streak people will say okay you know play really aggressive with janna you know that's been something really hot that people like to talk about lately play really aggressive as janna like max w and you know take scorch and airy and you know maybe even take ignite and she can be such a great lane aggressor well if you're against like zyra draven and your lane is like ezreal janna that's not going to be good because you're going to go up and try to use your W. If Zyra catches you with a root, you're going to get evaporated because you're going to have no shield. You're going to have no defense. You're going to have really low health because you don't have anything in resolve. You're not going to have guardians. So you don't have a shield. You're not going to have any extra MR for mirror shield. Um, so you're just going to get like evaporated by them if they ever catch you with anything, right? Um, and so, yes, if you're against something like an Ezreal and... Like an Ezreal and like a, a Braum or something like that. Just something that maybe doesn't have a ton of... Or like an Ezreal Tom Kench. Something that doesn't have a ton of kill threat immediately in the lane. Could you get a few points in W and harass with Janna? Maybe. Maybe. But you have to figure that out. You know? Like you have to be able to read that in Champion Select and decide what you want to do. So you need to understand if you're going into that lane... And your lane is Ezreal Janna against Zyra Draven. You are going to lose that lane. Unless your jungler comes down and, you know, just sits on your lane. Or unless they just, like, obscenely misplay the lane from the Draven Zyra side. You're going to lose it. But that doesn't mean you're going to lose the game. Okay? Because you can still have really good scaling. So you have to adjust. You have to say, okay, we just need to try to farm this and play as defensively as we can. Unless we get jungle help or unless they're really far out of position. Because they have a lot more early game power than we do. Okay? So you have to figure out how you should play the lane. And sometimes it means conceding the lane with grace. Okay? You need to learn how to concede lanes with grace. And that's very important to do. Alright? Because you can't just come in guns blazing and try to win every lane. You know, even if you have an aggressive comp. Like, let's say that you have the Draven and the Zyra. And you are against that Tom Kench and Ezreal on the end. And you're just playing really aggressively, like you're pushing them to the lane, you know, you're constantly like getting them under the tower, and then boom, here comes the jungler, here comes Sejuani, turns it around, kills you. Or here comes the TF, you know, teleporting from mid lane, or here comes the Irelia teleporting behind you from bot lane. Okay, so, you know, maybe these people are able to do this, maybe TF is massacring mid lane, maybe they're against a Fizz and TF is up like 50 CS and constantly has him pushed in the tower, you need to understand that. You need to look and say, okay, they have a TF. TF is dominating mid lane. So we can't be that aggressive in this lane. We can try to harass them, but we can't push much past halfway in the mid lane because of this global pressure. Or maybe this says like maybe your um your Volibear jungle is just like hanging out top lane the entire time, like trying to camp top and just like getting all the top farm. It just never goes bot side. And you know that Sejuani has already tried to gank you once and you blew your flash. You have to understand, she's going to come back because she knows you don't have flash. Okay? 
So you can't be that aggressive in the lane. You have to back up, even though in theory, yes, you could be massacring this Ezreal and Tom Kench if that jungler would just leave you alone. Or if TF like would not teleport bottom. That's not what's actually happening in the game. So you can't say, oh, boo-hoo, my jungler's not here. You know, I, I, we, we would have won this lane really hard, but my jungler's not here and their jungler's just camping me and this TF just keeps coming bottom. And Because you know these things can happen. Right? So it can be frustrating, right? When the jungler camps you, it can be frustrating if TF keeps teleporting on you or their top lane keeps teleporting on you or GF, or uh, GP Gangplank keeps using his ultimate bot lane because he's steamrolling top lane. You know, you might think, why can't the top laner just force GP to use his ult defensively? Why can't he do that? Um, on himself, top lane. Sometimes that's just not the case. So you have to improve your laning by understanding what's going on. So not only your individual ma matchups, but the overall macro. So the macro informs how your micro is. It informs the decisions that you should be making in the laning fights. Okay? So if you're a winning lane, you know, on the flip side, you don't want to play passively. Right? So, um... You know, if you are Draven Zyra and you're against Twitch Lulu, for example, and you have good ward coverage, um, your mid lane is doing respectable, and you know that their mid laner is not likely to teleport or roam on you, and like you know that their jungler is not camping you bottom, you should be aggressive. You should be denying CS. You should be going up there using your spells, really just brutalizing them. But that's not automatic, okay? So just because you have the aggressive lane doesn't mean that automatically you're always aggressive. You need to look at the rest of the game and be as aggressively be as aggressive as you possibly can and if they're camping you you might just have to lose the lane with grace okay that means not die get as much cs as you possibly can get as much warding as you can just try to help your team as much as you can but you're just not going to be able to dominate that lane that perhaps in the way that you want to that's just something that you have to accept so it's not lucky it's not unlucky that the you know the jungler is camping you or that TF keeps wanting to port down on top of you. To some extent, yeah, it's influencing the game, but you have agency over that. You can choose not to die to a gank. You can back up and just lose three CS instead of moving forward to try to get those CS and getting killed by TF or the jungler, right? You can control that. It is within your control. So, you know, lose the lane gracefully sometimes. Just say they have a better lane or their jungler's camping us or their mid laner keeps roaming bottom. We're just going to be down CS and I'm going to do my best not to die. Okay? You know, maybe they're about to four-man dive bottom. You see them rotating bottom on the wards that you have. Like, they're walking past red buff. They're walking past dragon. Their mid laner jungler is coming down. Your jungler is on the top side of the map. Your mid laner just backed. It's about to be a 4v200 tower. Weave the tower. Just leave. Just give them the tower. Just say, hey, it'd be really cool if mid lane was here to help us defend this or if the jungler, like stopped wasting time top lane and helped us out bot but you know what they're not so we're just gonna have to give this tower and that's losing gracefully okay so you're just minimizing your losses so that you have a better chance in the mid to the late game to win right because if you stay at that tower and they kill both of you at the tower and they get the tower and they get the dragon anyways you just gave them you know extra gold because they were going to get the tower they were going to get the dragon so you didn't accomplish anything by staying under the tower, right, in that scenario. So losing with grace just means denying as few resources as possible to the enemy, okay? Or denying as many resources as possible to the enemy. Okay, so even though they're going to get a lot of stuff, don't give them your life, you know, and try to CS the best you can. But that's just part of it. So part of laning, part of macroing is just understanding the dynamics of matchups, of game states, and being able to switch gears. Even if you are a winning lane, even if you are a losing lane, that could change depending on the junglers, depending on the mid lane. You know, if you're Ezreal Janna against, you know, the Draven Zyra, you, you could win that lane. You know, if you have um, Jarvan comes up and just mercilessly camps that lane three times in a row. He comes up, you know, level two cheeses, gets red buff, you know, gets raptors or whatever and just comes bottom and kills or maybe he starts up top at blue side does blue wolves red camps bottom you can win the lane right so even though it's janna ezreal against you know a superior lane you could still win 
So you just have to pay attention to that and understand the dynamics in order to understand uh, wave management or uh, lane management. I talk about wave management too in here. I'm not going to talk about that really quickly right now, but just understanding where to place the minions to give you the best chance to win is also really important and something that you control. You don't have to just walk up and auto attack the minions all the time. You can actually strategically place the wave in certain like positions in the lane, depending on how you want to play the lane, whether it's defensively or aggressively, depending on the game state. So watch the video. Um, I explain a lot more of that in there, but it's beyond the scope of this just brief overview. Then dodging and hitting skill shots, I talk about that a little bit too. So that's really cool. Be sure to check that out. And then finally, and this will be kind of the end of the video here. I don't want to go too long. It's already I wanted it to be an hour, but I also want it to be thorough. And I don't want to just say, go look at these other videos, you know, without giving you at least a little bit in this video for stuff you can do, right? So I'm trying to give you some good stuff. The final thing in my champion select video, oops, let me get the uh, Google Doc here. This is where I talk about things other than micro and macro. This is where I talk about overall game knowledge and how you can win in champion select through dodging and like how not surrendering is important and things like that. So dodging, watch this whole section, but basically the TLDR of it is if you dodge one game per day, that is a 40% or less chance to win you will get roughly over 200 days, you will get about 200 LP in a season. Okay, so that's two divisions. So if you just dodge one game per day, that's about a three LP game, then you will go up two divisions. That could be the difference in the, by the end of the season between gold two or gold two and platinum five or platinum two and diamond five. It's a very big deal. Like, you need to learn how to use your dodges. And I talk about when and why you should do it here. But basically, the quick version is, if you're gaining and losing 20 LP, which is average, um, then your first dodge you should use at 40%. Um, if you have a 40% or less chance to win, and you should use your second dodge, your 10 LP, if you have a 25% or less chance to win. So I go in and I talk about the difference between what is LP, what is MMR, how do those interact with each other, um... Uh, and then which, I do the math for you and explain certain thresholds, like why should you dodge at 40%? Why is that number significant? Why should you dodge at 25? Why is that number significant? So I go into all of that. Then I talk about different ways that you can try to determine your chance to win. So when you're looking at that champion select screen, how do you interpret that? How do you know, okay, we're favored in this match or we're not favored in this match? Or how can you say, all right, we have you know roughly a 40% chance to win or we have roughly like a 30% chance to win? It's not an exact science, but there are a few different theories you know, that I came up with that I think can help you get a ballpark you know, estimation about your chances to win. So that's the strong champion theory. So just thinking that each player is about a 20% chance of your overall success. So if you're just looking at a head-to-head -head comparison, what about those matchups? Who's going to win? Okay. If three champions on your team have favorable matchups against the enemy, three people on the enemy team, you could say that's roughly a 60% chance that you're going to win that game. Okay. So that's going to be a good game. However, if there is only if two people on your team that have favorable matchups against the enemy team, that's going to be about a 40% chance to win. So you might consider dodging that one. Okay. Now, there are different metrics that I talk about to measure strength, scaling, usefulness of composition, uniquely powerful, limited counterplay, low margin for error, consistency, all that stuff. Um, but just keep in mind, this theory does not account for specific interactions between different champions. So, for example, if you think of Yasuo, you know, maybe Yasuo is, um, I don't know the exact, like, matchups with Yasuo in the top lane um, precisely, but maybe you might say, okay, Yasuo is uh, favored against Nar. I know that's a really common counter, or at least they talk about it on the analyst desk a lot in pro games, that Yasuo is a potential counter to Nar in the top lane. So maybe you'll think that that's the case. So maybe Yasuo is slightly better um, in that team comp, but if you have like an Alistar on your team or um, a Malphite middle or a Cho'Gath middle or just something else, like a bunch of things with knockups, then Yasuo becomes much better in a team comp, right? Or if you have something like a Cannon on your team. Uh, that just really wants this like team fight AOE like just massive impact and he's going to be a lot better in an AOE team comp if you have like a Jarvan on your team or just um, you know other champions like that that can hold people in place or for example someone like a Rengar and this is a very popular pro team comp 
Rengar with a Shin. So if you have a Shin top lane, and a they used to call this the submarine comp. Um, if you have a Shin top lane and a Rengar jungle, you can go invisible with that Rengar, jump onto their back line while Shin is ulting you, then Shin appears, and then he can taunt the back line as well. So that's a really powerful interaction that isn't specifically reliant upon 1v1 matchup. So, for instance, Shin might lose top lane against Nar and lane. Um, but because you have a Rengar on your team and you have a really good coordinated like mid-game comp, then um, you know maybe it's more powerful. Uh, so even though um, you know Shin has a weaker champion in lane, later in the game, his champion might be more useful than that Nar in specific team fights. Janna is another great example of this. You know, Janna loses lane to almost everybody in terms of, like, strong champion, but she scales so well into the mid and the late game, especially if you have certain kinds of AD carries, like Jinx or Twitch, who scale off of Critical Strike, because of the way that interacts with the AD that she gets on her shield. So, you know, strong champion is useful to think about, but don't think about that exclusively without considering some of these other theories as well. Another theory is winning lane theory. This is similar to strong... Um, champion theory but you could think if each one of your lanes is going to win you know mid uh top and bot then um there's a good chance you're going to win the game if you win every single lane so last night there was a great example of this right so on stream the last game that i played on uh, february 9th you know a lot of people were saying in chat this is a terrible team comp this is garbage i would dodge this it's bad but i was looking at it and i thought I don't think it's that bad because... Um, I can just pull it up here really quickly. Just ignore my overall win rate. I'm ashamed. Oh, OP.GG is the name. I've had a really bad week um, this week. But uh, I do want to talk about this one game here. Um, so we, we will get it back. These percentages are just awful. So if you're watching this in like November or something, you know, hopefully I'm a lot higher than this. But, you know, and so that gives me some validity with this, right? I'm not crying. I'm not saying it's a lot of luck. Uh, you know, I know there are a lot of things that I could improve on. We'll talk about that here in a second. Like what I personally am taking away from, you know, doing this research and thinking about these things. But um, look at this team comp. So it's Riven, Kane, Lucian, Varus, Zyra. Okay, so a lot of people would say, oh, this is a trash team comp, right? Like, we don't have any tanks. Um, we have 4 AD. That's why I picked Zyra's, because we needed AP on the team. Um, and there's just, we're going to lose this, so why don't we dodge? Well, if you look closely at strong lane theory, every single lane wins, right? So Riven is going to win against Sion in lane, or she should, right? Lucian should win against Swain. And Varus, Zyra should win against Vayne Thresh. So all three of our lanes are winning. And Kane is kind of a push against Warwick. Like they're both, Warwick might be slightly stronger in theory, early game than Kane is. But we have a really strong early game. So if every lane wins and we properly uh, snowball our advantage, then we should be able to close out and win the game. So even though we don't have tanks, we have some champions that are kind of high variance like Riven. Um, we have some kind of weird picks like Lucian Middle, which was popular for a while, but we haven't seen it in a while. It made sense because of the strong lane theory, right? Because e every lane won, and so we were able to close out and win the game in 22 minutes. All right? So you could think about a strong lane in terms of kills, how you know how much gold are you getting, how much CS are you getting. You could think of pressure, how fast can you take towers in roam. And you can think about scaling, just how well is your team going to scale. Sometimes you win the lane just because your team is going to scale harder than theirs. So if you are playing something like um, Jinx and Janna, and you are against Tom Kench and Jin, if you just get out of that lane without dying and only being down like 10 or 15 CS, you could consider that a win. That could be a one lane because you're going to scale much harder than their team will. Okay? And so... Um, for example, Lulu, Draven Lulu is likely a winning lane over Ezreal Janna is what I use here because Draven is more likely um, to get kills or to get CS than Ezreal Janna. Draven will push Ezreal to the tower, and so he's going to have a lot more map pressure. He's going to be able to roam better. He's going to get more damage on the tower, so he's going to have more pressure. And then Draven scales better than Ezreal, at least at the time when I made this. And I think that's probably true after the Ezreal nerfs. Draven is one of the highest scaling AD carries in the game in terms of raw damage. Okay? Um... 
But you could also think of it like this. Twitch Janna is also likely to be a winning lane against Lucian Karma when I made this. So Lucian is more likely to get kills in CS than Twitch is in lane. Lucian will push the Twitch to the tower, most likely. But Twitch will dramatically outscale Lucian unless Lucian is really far behind. So reasonable people can disagree about the importance of scaling when you're thinking about lane dominance. But there's no other way to explain why Janna historically is almost always a top 5 support and is always a powerhouse in solo queue if it's strictly based on gold and pressure because she doesn't do either one of those she doesn't provide a lot of pressure and you know she's one of the lowest kill conversion champions in the bottom lane right for a support okay but yet she wins a lot so how is that it's because she scales so hard and i have an entire janna guide on the channel if you want to know about that and i'm going to make a new video about itemization and scaling here pretty soon i do have like two videos about that on the channel but <coughs> i'll do an updated one for season eight and then finally, experience theory is another one you could think of. So just copy-paste into the lobby, um, the op.gg of people, like I showed earlier, and just look and see, right? So many players, you know, just see if they have a lot of experience. Is it first time on that champion? Do they have a lot of experience on it? Um, what are the items that they're building? Does it seem like they know what they're doing um, when they're building these champions? So um, a lot of players, you know, perform better on champions they have experience with but you know a lot of people think of this as a false dichotomy they'll say um well should i play a champion that i have experience on or should i play a champion that's like really good or meta right now and my answer to that is why not learn champions that are good <laughs> you know or that are like really strong in the meta so yeah you know if you have a thousand games on um heimerdinger jungle or something like that and you have like a 51 percent win rate should you play Heimerdinger jungle or should you play um, Ramus jungle that you have no games on? Even though Ramus, a lot of people would consider Ramus to be a better jungler than Heimerdinger. Well, probably you should play Heimerdinger in that example because you have a thousand games on him and you know a lot more and you have, you know, higher than a 50% win rate. But I would say, you know, you would climb overall faster if you just learned how to play something like Ramus Jungle or if you learned how to play something like Sejuani Jungle. So, you know, for an individual game, should you play something you have more experience on even if it's not as strong in a given meta right now? Yes. But overall, if you really want to climb, you need to learn how to play champions that are strong in meta. Like, have experience and play good champions. And yes, it does change over time, but there are some champions that are historically really good in a lot of different metas and will probably be good throughout. And you can check out the main channel. I have a one trick, um, one trick recommendations or one trick analysis video on the channel. It's super popular. And that's where I point out champions that are like that, that are good historically in almost any meta and will continue to be good most likely. So if you want to know about that, which champions should you be learning, then check that video out. But in general, the best solution to this is just have experience on strong champions. It's not a, it doesn't have to be that way. Experience or strong champion, it can be both. Okay. Um, okay, and then I think the biggest thing to take away here as well is don't surrender games. So this is the last point that I want to make, and that'll, that'll probably be it for the video. Um, don't surrender games. Like, hardly ever ranked games. And the, the reason for that is not because... And this is something you can control, all right? This is not lucky. You choose whether you press the surrender button or not, okay? So it is, it's not luck. You choose whether you press it or not. Okay, so the reason for this is not because you genuinely think that you're going to win all of the tough games, because you're not. You know, it's disingenuous to say, you know, everything's rainbow and sunshine. We can always win, even if we have three inhibitors down and all this. No, you're going to lose most of those games. But the reason that you play it is because statistically you will win some of those games and you don't know which games they are. Okay. So you can win games where, you know, you're down 15 kills. I've lost games where I've been up 15 kills on my team. Trust me. There was a game a couple of nights ago where my team was up 16 to two with like, and I think we had five or six towers on them and we lost because my team got too cocky and they started arguing with each other. And the enemy team just outscaled us. So, like, we were far ahead, but they ended up having something that scaled really well, like a Twitch or an Azir or something like that. And the team just goofed around, you know, tried to 1v4, 1v5. You know, Tristana was like, LOL, I just jumped into three people to try to get some kills. I died. And we lost. Um, so, 
there are games that look unlikely that um, you can actually win. So even if you only have a 5% chance to win, um, you know, you will win five of those games. If you played that 100 times, you will win five. And I'll tell you what, that's a full division. Okay? Um, and sometimes, like, those games matter at the end of a season. I'll tell you, in Season 6, I was Diamond 5. In Season 7, I was two games away from Diamond 5. I was in promos for Diamond. Um, and we lost we lost the promos. I won one game, and then we lost the next. So I was two games short. Two games out of... And I ended up playing about 2,000 games over the course of the season. And some people were just like, oh my god, like 2,000 games. It's not that much, honestly. So if, if you play like 300, game, 300 days a year... That's like six games. That's six games a day or something. Six or seven games a day. Is that a lot for some people? Sure. But if you're a streamer, that's not really a lot. That's like four hours, right? Um, if you think each game is, you know, roughly 30 minutes or so, it's going to be like, you know, four hours. Um, four hours would give you eight games. But then you also have queue time and, you know, you got to go get a drink or go to the bathroom or whatever. So it's going to be, you know, four, somewhere at four to five hours, something like that. So it's not like an insane amount. And that's just over 300 games. Like that's assuming that you have 65 days per year where you just don't play, right? So that's like, you know, you're playing like five or six days a week. So yeah, that's a lot more than your average bear. But it's not like an insane, like impossible number to get to, right? Um... And out of that, I just needed two more games out of 2,000. So if I just had a 0.1% higher win percentage, I would have had it. Not even 1%, one-tenth of a percent of a higher win percentage, and I would have had it. So if I go back and think about all of those 2,000 games that I played, where I, you know, didn't surrender, but my teammates, you know, outvoted me and did, or maybe even some games where I did surrender. I don't do it often, but sometimes I do. Very rarely. Uh, but even if I played out every single game, and if my teammates played out every single game of those that looked unlikely, I will guarantee you we would have won two games in there somewhere out of 2,000. It's just impossible not to win games, right? But people give up. They just AFK in the fountain. You know, they'll just leave the game. They'll DC, or they just won't try their best. They'll troll. They'll argue with people, and they'll just spam the surrender vote, Right? And if they didn't do that, then they would climb a lot more. I'll guarantee you, you would climb a lot more. I know I would have been diamond, certainly, if that was the case. Now, there are other ways I could have been diamond, too. I could have improved my own play and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But this is free wins. It's free. You don't lose anything by playing out games. The only thing you lose is your time, right? And some people might argue, well, I don't want to be in this game anymore. It's frustrating. You know, I just don't want to deal with that psychologically. That's fine, but you can't complain about your rank if you're going to do that because you're giving up a lot of free games. Right? Um, so, you know, you have to decide if it's up to you. But if your ultimate goal is to climb as far as you can, you need to not surrender games. Okay? And, like, there are very, very dire circumstances, maybe. But people surrender way, way too many games. Okay? So you need to have a long-term perspective and this is something, once again, it's not lucky. This is 100% you control this. You choose to press surrender or not. Um, and if you just play out all of these games, you will minimize this aspect of luck and you will win more games. Okay, then I'll talk more about lowering your champion pool, playing, playing what wins, learning something from every game, and a bunch more stuff in this video. So be sure to check it out. It's a good video. A lot more details about those things. So, you know, the TLDR... Play strong champions, push your advantage, try to close out games, have really good macro understanding, do your research, dodge more games, especially if they look really unfavorable. And the last thing here that I don't have an entire video about, but I'll just mention really quickly, is just focus up more. This is something that you know a lot of YouTubers will say, but um, it is really important, is to come in and focus on how to win. Try not to be distracted by you know, your text messages or your roommate or just like too much by listening to like some crazy music or something that's going to break your concentration. You're just like playing when you're just like really drunk or just really tired or hungry or like depressed about your day or whatever. Um, or if you just lost like maybe three games in a row and you're just like really starting to get into this like, man, I'm really unlucky or this is bad or you're just like, as people say, maybe tilted, um, then try not to play as much. Now, this is something that's very difficult for me 
to do and I'm trying to get better about this, but you know, my biggest problem I think right now that's kind of held me back over the last couple of over really just the last week or so um is that I pay too much attention to the chat. Okay? Especially on losing games because what happens and this is just like this is the narrative, right? This happens every time if I lose a couple of games you know, there will be some people in the chat that come out and they're just like, oh, you know, you suck or this guy's bad or whatever. And so, you know, then like a mod will have to remove them or something. And then people will say, you know, why did you remove that guy? You know, and it just starts like all this friction in the chat where you have people that are stirring up trouble either directly, you know, saying things like um, you're bad or whatever, or just trying to like, backseat game and undermine a lot of stuff like why didn't you do this why didn't you do that um why are you playing this champion that champion's really bad why don't you play this champion this champion's really good um you know that type of stuff and then you know people will start you know trying to explain things and then it you know can devolve into an argument and then i'm trying to read the chat and like trying to respond and explain a lot of my decisions and justify everything that i do like all the time and then that takes away from my focus on the game. So I'm focusing on kind of the past and I'm focusing on, you know, these people in the chat instead of these specific people in the chat. And I want to emphasize too that most people in the chat are just awesome, wonderful people that are just here all the time. And I really appreciate everybody. But I think that also other people in the chat get tired of that too, that narrative, right? Like I've had people say, just ignore them, professor. Or just like, just leave them alone or whatever. And that's what I should do. I mean, that's true. Um, so that's not to say that to shut down like productive dialogue, it's just to say that I have to stop getting distracted by people that <laughs> that my wife said are haters <laughs> in the other room. But it's not even necessarily haters, it's just like the backseat, um, you know, gamers and people that maybe don't have the context or maybe something works for them. Like there are some people that are straight up haters, but it's also, you know, I know there are some people that that's just how they roll. They just like to be contrarian. They like to disagree with a lot of stuff that I say and you know it does sometimes produce some interesting conversations like this guy who was talking about luck that inspired me to make this video here that just like could not like possibly fathom how we could be anything other than luck um so to some extent you know he was trying to maybe defend me I don't know at the start of the conversation he was trying to give me an out. He was trying to give me an easy answer to say, oh, I'm just losing because I'm unlucky, but I'm not going to take that answer because it's not accurate. <laughs> like, there are things I could be doing better. Um, so anyways, for me, that's the problem with the focus, especially, you know, when I go on a loss streak, it's just like not watching the chat as much, just moving on, just paying attention to the game at hand, like still talking, you know, still commenting and, you know, narrating what I'm doing, helping people learn how to become better players, but don't watch the chat while I'm playing, if I'm on a lost streak especially, and then, you know, check it out between games while we're in queue and stuff like that, I think would be very helpful. Um, and then another thing is, like, just don't just stop playing. If you get two or three losses in a row, you know, just consider, like, not playing. And I know for me, that's really hard to do as a streamer, especially if I lose three in a row right at the beginning of the stream, I still have another three hours to go. And I can't just stop. I can't just like say, all right, hang on, guys. Let me go take a quick 20-minute break. You know, people signed up to come and watch me play League. And, you know, some people say, well, just go play Normals. It's like, I can do that sometimes, maybe, but a lot of people don't like it when I play Normals. They want to see ranked. Like, they want the competition. They want the narrative. They want to see if I'm going to climb back. So, really, I save the Normals for donation games. And the only reason I do that, you know, a big part of it is because I don't want to put my teammates at a disadvantage while I am, you know, earning some money, you know, giving some commentary on a champion that a viewer wants to see, right? And so I don't think they should have to pay. They should have to pay the price. I don't think my uh, teammates should have to pay the price because, you know, I'm, you know, doing this donation game, right? So that's why I do normals. Um, when I very first started doing donation games back in early uh, 2017, when um, uh, Mr. Nobody, I believe, came up with the idea for this, he was the, he was the original donator, I think it was $50 for a Teemo support game. I, I played some of these games. It was Mr. Nobody, a bunch of other people too. I played them in ranked and they were fun. They were interesting. But at the end of the day, I came to the conclusion that I just thought it was kind of bad or unethical or um, whatever because it was lowering my team's chances to win. So I, I had to start doing that in normals. But anyways, if you're not a streamer, 
um, you know, then you should take a break. You should go and do something else if you're not focused. So if you're too tilted to make rational decisions, you know, if you're making just really bad decisions, then you need to stop. If you're just annoyed at the previous game, but you think that you're still, um, you know, playing at an optimal level, then you can keep playing. But I think those are kind of the two biggest things. Just focus up, you know, don't, don't try to text, don't try to talk to your roommate, don't try to watch a TV show on the side or, um, you know, any of these other potential distractions while you're playing. Just make sure that you've had enough to eat, you've had enough to drink, you come in, you're focused up, you're not worried too much about what's going on in the outside world and you're just going to win this game of League of Legends. Okay, and it sounds simple, but it's not, especially for me. And then um, also if you feel yourself getting tilted and just be honest with yourself, there's nothing wrong with getting tilted. Just recognize it. Just say, you know what? I'm too stressed out. I'm too mad at that last game. I need to chill. I'm not going to play this next game. I'm just going to watch a watch a funny TV show or something, and then I'll come back to League here in an hour or two. Or something like that. You know, for people that don't stream, that's a good option. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And that's how you can influence luck, too. So it's not, you know, sometimes it's not unlucky that you keep losing this game. Sometimes it's because you're not making good decisions because you're tilted that you're losing the games. Or it's because you're too distracted so you might know what you need to do, but you might not just actually be doing that because you're too busy texting somebody or you're too busy talking to your roommate or you're too busy worrying about this, you know, economics uh, exam that you have in six hours that you're putting off while you play league or something like that, right? Or whether this girl's going to call you back or this guy's going to call you back or whatever. So just make sure you focus up a bit more. Okay, and that's going to be it. Um, thank you very much. I really intended this video to be a bit shorter, but I did want to be thorough with it. So all of these are things you can do to reduce luck in league of legends right so luck oftentimes are just a collection of factors variants that people have a lot more control over than they think and they just don't understand how to control it right they don't understand they can dodge they don't understand macro properly they don't understand like how to evaluate their mental state to make good decisions um and so hopefully you know you're going to become a lot more aware of that and solo queue will become a lot more approachable and you can climb now that you understand i hope that over time it's not luck there is variance from time to time, but there are very specific strategies and techniques that you can do to climb up ranked and to improve as a player um, to reach the goals that you want to for the season. So thank you very much. Have a good day, and I'll see you next time.